Hi everyone and welcome to another one of our library virtual events. We are partnering with CTC professor Julie Andrada and she's got a great program for us today. We're going to be um, following Professor Andrada on a photo nature walk and she will be telling, giving us some wonderful information about what you can do when you have a camera and you're on our CTC campus. So I'm going to go ahead and let Professor Andrada take it over. Welcome. Hi. Yes. Um, good morning. Welcome to the photo walk. Uh, we kind of have an interesting presentation today. Um, we have a combination of a video and a PowerPoint that I'll be speaking of to um, We'll be going back and forth during the presentation. So let's get rolling with the video. Welcome, welcome uh, to the Central Texas campus, Central Texas College campus. My name is Julie Andrada. I'm a visual arts professor here on campus and I teach the photography one and two uh, classes along with art history and art appreciation. Today we're going to do a, a tour of the campus and oh. so hang on. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Tips on how to photograph. Uh, first off, I'd like to start with this um, hallway. Uh, it's got great features. If you notice the repetitive uh, patterns of the arches and the leading lines, this is a really great place to take architectural pictures along with any portraiture work you would like to do. So we're going to get started with that here in a second. Uh, one thing, if you're wondering about my camera equipment, because I know a lot of people, photo people, like to know the geeky tech stuff, I shoot a Nikon D810 full frame camera. It gives me nice big files. And today I'm shooting a Nikkor 60 millimeter macro lens. Okay. Okay, so we are, like I said, we are going back and forth between the um, uh, video that we present that we made and some more information. I talk a little bit about my camera. It is a Nikon D810 full uh, frame. Uh, these are my camera settings, just for those of you who are interested. I shoot what's called a raw foam format file. Uh, it is a uh, similar think of if you're familiar with uh, analog or film shooting film is considered like a negative. When I'm capturing images, I want to get as much information as possible to have large files. So down the road, I can actually make have prints made like a photograph, like an actual physical photograph, not just something that I put out on Instagram or the website or Facebook. I like to print my files. Um, and make photographs. I also shoot at a low ISO, say 100 to 200. The re reason I do that is because of image quality. Um, I can actually go up much higher on my camera um, because it is a full form, uh, full uh, frame camera. Uh, most people, the consumer, that even some of the higher end consumer cameras shoot a crop sensor. Um, and you need to be careful with that ISO setting. I also shoot on manual and my camera has all sorts of fancy bells and whistles on it, which occasionally I do use, but I particularly like to shoot on manual because I want to control my apertures and shutter speeds. And we'll get into that a little bit later, but it is important for me because I can make creative decisions. Now I do shoot on aperture pr priority, which means I set what my aperture opening is going to be, and my camera figures out the shutter speed and the ISO, and I use that for a lot of my manual, uh, my macro, excuse me, photography. And I do use a shutter speed priority if I um, know that I'm going to be uh, photographing a lot of action, set, 
you know, perhaps I'm pho photographing a live concert, um, something along that nature, or it's just easier for me to have my shutter speeds shut set and the aperture and the ISO, the camera will um, uh, figure out for me. Um, I also don't put any of the enhancements. I have no enhancements. Some cameras will have portrait setting or landscapes or, you know, black and white or any of that. I don't do that. I want my files um, uh, with as much information as possible. And I want to make those edits after those editing decisions after I um, capture my image. And I also use um, the Adobe RGB 1998 color space because that is giving me, um, once again, going back to information, I'm collecting information for my image. And if you shoot something like sRGB color space, that is more for um, the internet and smaller files. So that's just kind of elaborating more in my camera settings. I also have a couple images um, getting some of my architecture work so you can see some of what I do. Uh, this is Fuzzy Was He. This is a pet grooming uh, uh, establishment out over in the Taylor, uh, Texas area, which I drove past it a couple weeks ago. It's still there. I guess Fuzzy was still he. Um, and I love one thing I love about this image, I have the primary, you know, the pop colors, the blues, the reds, the greens. And I personally love photographing kind of these older um, architectural structures um, that to me have a lot of personality in, in them. Um, I, it almost tells I can make up stories about what I'm looking at. Um, I also love photographing. Here's a nature shot of mine um, that. Uh, sunflowers, I always love photographing sunflowers. Typically when I photograph, I'm photographing later in the day because I'm not a morning person. So uh, when I'm out, best times to photograph outside is uh, early in the morning or later in the day. So I choose later in the day and I'm always looking for um, the beautiful Texas skies to have in my um, images. And I have one more here. Here's another image of um, in Taylor, Texas. Uh, like I said, I'm always looking for the interesting architectural features to photograph, uh, like we find on the CTC campus. So um, that is, uh, I have one more, I believe. Nope, I think that's it. Cindy, I'm going to hand it back to you to continue on with. Great. Right. Okay, we're now over here at the gazebo on campus. This is uh, used for uh, concerts during the day. I love this feature because the color of the roof, I think it's really unique. Today is a really nice, almost perfect day to photograph it because of all the beautiful clouds we have in the sky, which I love the clouds here in Texas. I'm originally from California and we don't have this type of clouds as um, much out there as we do here. So whenever they're in the sky, I love to go and, and photograph. Once we're done with that, we're going to go down and there's plants around the bottom of the gazebo. We're going to be doing macro, what we call macro photography of the plants, which means we're going to get in really close. And I like to do this type of work because you can have some fun with it. You can get in really close, um, create some interesting and unique abstract images that don't necessarily read that, oh, this is a leaf or a flower. So that's what we're going to do next. Okay. Okay, let me share my screen here really quick. Okay, can you all see it there? Okay, getting back to my love of old buildings and architecture. 
Um, I have some more old built an old building from over in Taylor. Um, I love exploring. So when I go out and about, um, I will just drive someplace and, and I'll go exploring and take my camera. Um, and I forgot to add a lot of these images that I'm, I'm showing today are images that I've captured with a film camera. I still shoot a lot of film. Um, I do shoot obviously digital as well, but I like to mix it up. And here's a, a building, an old building over in Taylor. You see the repetitive um, patterns in it. You see the sky reflected up top here. Um, it's really, really a wonderful, wonderful. I love the colors of this image. Um, I also like industrial, old industrial areas. And this is a tribute to a uh, husband wife team. Um, Bella, um, uh, Burn and Hilla Becker, they photographed old abandoned industrial um, uh, sites in Europe. And so this is over in Granger. Here's another view of it. Here's a view. Oh, CTC campus. So and you can see the puffy, puffy clouds. And one thing I like photographing when it's kind of a high. Oh, what we call a high overcast day with these pretty puffy clouds. It makes it easier to shoot during the middle of the day. So the images that we're doing on our photo walk through the video, that was the middle of the day. And like I said, in the, in the video, high overcast, we have clouds. And here's another shot that was taking about the same time um, of day. And here's another view. You're getting that cloud covering in there. And aperture, let's talk about aperture for or a minute because it ties into what we call uh, depth of field, which is important and what I use a lot in my uh, macro work, which we'll see coming up here. Um, the aperture is the size of the opening in the lens. Your lens has two, has an, every lens has an aperture and it's part of what controls the uh, depth of field and we call it an f-stop. And here's this represented right here. And if you notice down here on the left, we have what's considered like an F 1.4. Some of you may have cameras that will open up that wide. And the smaller the number, as I tell my students, the smaller the number, the larger the opening. And what that, um, what, you, what is great about that is that you can really kind of start getting some abstract in your say macro, macro meaning up close work uh, that I do. And that kind of creates with that larger opening that creates what we call a blurry background, a shallow depth of field. Some people call it bokeh. I don't really like that term um, because it's tied into a, a form of Japanese painting, I think is where it came from. But it's actually, it circles a confusion when you look at light theory. Um, so wider, wider depth of fields are represented by a smaller aperture number. And if you look at the right, you have a smaller opening, which is a larger number, F22. And that's when you can get more, um, more uh, focus, more sharpness in your in, in your image. So that's a little bit about uh, aperture and depth of field and how that ties in. Now, one thing that's the factors of depth of field, you have your aperture opening, your focal length um, of your lens, your lens comes in different lenses come in different sizes. My camera, I can take my lens off and change them out. I have a, a longer lens, um, my macro lens, which is a 105. And I also have a wider angle lens, which is a 60 millimeter, which is, which is actually what I was shooting in the video. Um, also to your uh, distance from the subject, um, the farther you are from the subject, the greater depth of field or more focus that you will have in your image. So these are all factors you need to think about if you're really wanting to control your image making and control that um, image that you're capturing. And here's some examples with aperture. You see on the left, you have a small number, big opening, and only the front cherry is really in focus. And you see the other cherries back here falling out of focus. 
when you make the aperture a little smaller to say eight f8 on your camera uh, you can see a little bit more in focus of the cherries and when you stop all the way down to a small aperture like 22 or here we have uh, f32 you start getting much a much more clearer uh, view vision of what is in your camera frame so that's kind of represents uh, different aperture uses and here's one with your different uh, wide angle lens on the left is a 24 millimeter and then a longer lens at 200 millimeter, which would be a longer lens. It compresses the frame and compresses the background. So you can see right here, same subject, same view, but you have more information that you can read as a viewer with a wide angle lens versus a um, longer lens. So these are all things as a photographer you can choose to think about and make creative choices. And you know, it's great. If you're at a family affair and it's great, you want to run, want to run around and snap uh, pictures, that's great. But if you want to kind of take a moment and think about uh, what you want to photograph, what you want to say with your images, then these are some of the tools that you need to be thinking about. Um, and here's one that represents dif distance. If you look, this is all the same frame, all the same aperture, all the same subjects being ISO, but the distance, the physical distance that you are from the subject changes. So you have a, a you have some visuals here that show you how this kind of all comes together to create an image. And here's some of my macro work. So I'm shooting a macro lens, which can I can get up close to the flowers. I love to photograph the Texas wildflower season. It was kind of a bust this year. I think it's because we all froze in February. Um, but uh, I, I love photographing the flowers. It's, they're so vibrant. And this is shot with a what I call it's a macro lens, it's up close, it's a 105 Nikon, Nikkor lens, and I'm shooting right around an aperture of 2.0. So um, it's a large aperture and you can see how the, the, the background gets blurry. And this is an effective thing to use, whether you, you're using it for a portrait or a wildflower. But when you want your subject to stand out, which right here is this, wildflower, uh, this is a technique that you can go ahead and make a choice to do. Um, here's another, we all know the blue bonnet, the, the flower of the state flower of Texas. And when I'm out shooting, I always like to get, I look for the different angles. I always look for the angles, I look for something to abstract. I'm always trying to see how I can put a different spin on an image. And uh, then what I've been working on a project is I take these images and I've been and I've been putting them on coasters and trivets and I have a book and, and different things and down the road I would actually like to monetize them and, and start selling them because uh, this is my retirement so I've been doing this I've been working on this for a while um, here's another image see the Texas wildflowers Another view. So just giving it that little pop and really directing the viewer to where I want them to look. Oh, that's the next one. Okay, um, I am done with this. I'll turn it back over to you, Cynthia. Next, we're going to photograph this beautiful sculpture that sits in the middle of the C Central Texas College campus. Uh, it was put together by the welding department. I'm not quite sure who on campus designed it, but it's really cool. And I like the fact that it has repetitive uh, shapes and lots of interesting, uh, I think we can get a lot of interesting abstract images from it. So let's go photograph it.
Wasn't this the one you wanted? Yep. Okay. Okay, so a couple of things. Okay, so we were talking about getting close to things and kind of been touching on composition throughout this. And granted, we all know this is a yard bird, um, but I used my macro lens. I got close to this bird and it's a frame within a frame. So you see the barbed wire. We have a repetitiveness to uh, this uh, image with uh, repetitive patterns with the um, cage being out of focus. But I framed and I and I framed this bird right like that, so we can tell who is the who is the important what is the important element of this image, which is that bird's great face. And I'm not familiar with chickens. I know there's different varieties of them, and so I I just thought this this. This bird deserved a photograph because he or she was so beautiful and so interesting. And then I have another one. Here's another guy. I mean, look at the framing. Look at this bird's face. Um, the framing, once again, I have a frame within a frame. It's been thrown out of focus to not to distract from this gorgeous, this gorgeous yard bird. So um, I just thought they were absolutely gorgeous birds to photograph when I had the opportunity to do so. So back to you. Wait. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Sorry about that. And this little critter, this is a macro shot that I did um, at uh, out in the sunflowers and I happened, he happened to pop up on my um, in my camera, which was um, fun to and I didn't even I saw him actually saw him after I snapped it. I was looking more for the greens and at first I, he was a surprise. He was a happy surprise is what we get sometimes in photography, but he's just hanging out there on the sunflower. And once again, a macro shot, once again, the shallow depth of field that I love to use, he stands out and surprises us there, he or she, I should say. And lastly, here is a sunflower kind of giving it it's the hero treatment. I drop down low, shooting up against the sky. And um, I also love sunflowers. Uh, I know blue bonnets are the state flower, but sunflowers are my favorites. I love sunflowers. And there's all, once I got into photographing um, sunflowers, I found that there are all sorts of varieties of sunflowers. So I love photographing them. So now, Cynthia, I'll send it back to you. Okay, so we are now down at the duck pond here on the CTC campus. A couple things I'm going to do down here. Um, obviously, you have the ducks you can photograph. You, there's some turtles, I believe, floating around. But I'm going to look at the, there's a water fountain in the middle of the pond here. And I'm going to do one thing if you ever want to do, uh, play around with what's called the shutter speed of your camera, which controls the motion. Uh, you can go ahead and, and do that. This is a great would be a great example. You're going to need a tripod. Anytime you're sh using a shutter below one sixtieth of a second, you should put a, uh, your camera on a tripod, which is kind of a rule of thumb. There's some ins and outs to that, but it's a good rule of thumb. So right now I have my camera set up. I have it framed, and I'm going to do a shutter speed of one five hundredth of a second so that should give me maybe some stop uh almost water droplets on the fountain so i'm going to go ahead and make that capture and now i'm going to do one with a slower shutter speed that's going to make the water look almost like a waterfall coming out so i'm going to make an adjustment and as I adjust my shutter speed, I need to adjust my aperture. So I'm going to need to what's called close down my aperture. Okay, this has gotten a little hazy feel. To okay. All right.
Are we ready to share? Yep. Okay, so talking about apertures and shutter speeds, we're a little early here. So stopping the action and creating motion blurs, what we do with the shutter speed. So we have your apertures, which we're talking about. I've shown examples. Now the shutter speed. And that's the other thing that we I can control with my uh, camera. I'll be honest, I use my aperture as uh, for creating much more than my shutter speed because of the type of work I do. Um, but it's still important. And the shutter speed is it determines the duration of the light exposed on the film or the sensor, and it controls the motion in the image. Um, and here are the full shutter, shutter speeds on most cameras. There's also bulb or uh, uh, what's called a bulb setting, which allows the shutter to stay open as long as you want it to. Um, but it, they usually go from one second all the way up to one four thousandths of a second, if not higher on some of the uh, newer cameras. Um, and here's an example of um, just a person walking through. And you can see you start getting blur here, blur, blur. It's a little sharper and she has stopped and that's just somebody walking. Um, you also have an example, which was what I was trying to demonstrate with the waterfall um, there, the water um, fountain, excuse me, there at, at the lake, uh, the pond there at CTC campus a faster shutter speed, you can almost get that water breaking down. And then at a slower shutter speed, you can get this flow of water, which a lot of uh, photographers like to use. So that's a little bit about shutter speeds. Um, Cynthia, I'll send it back to you. Okay. to it. I'm going to do one more. I'm at one eighth of a second for my shutter speed and it does have a, a little bit of blurred motion to it. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, lastly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how to make a panoramic image. If you, okay. oh, if you could keep going a little bit, Cynthia. Okay. You don't have a wide angle lens. So I'm going to take my camera and for panoramics, we usually think of a landscape orientation, meaning horizontal. And a lot of people photograph their panoramics that they're going to put together, meaning they're going to photograph more than one image of uh, the scene. Um, they usually shoot it this way. And that's not really uh, the most advantageous thing to do. It's better to shoot it vertically or in portrait. And what you can do when you do that you get more pieces to put together. So stitching is when you take more than one image and put it together to, uh, you take, you know, three, four, five images and put it together to make one big image. And when you're doing this, you can adjust the exposure. You need to be mindful of that, but don't adjust your aperture because if you adjust your aperture as part of this, you're going to change your depth of field. And that will give me five images that I can put together as a panoramic. That's all I have for today. So I want to thank you for coming to my talk and look forward to any questions you have. Okay. Uh, okay, so let me do my last part here in the PowerPoint. So let me go share. Okay, panoramic photo, panorama photos. Panorama, yeah, panoramic. Okay, so I orientate the camera vertically on a tripod. I always overlap the images a little bit. Change the shutter speed if needed for exposure. I stitch together, which means I take the image. I have, an, I have something I want to photograph, but I don't have a wide enough lens for it. So I can take little pieces of that image and what's called stitching them together. And you have to put them together through some sort of a program. And I use Lightroom Classic. I also have used Photoshop. And then I have two programs here listed, uh, Huggin and Auto Stitch, which are free programs. So if you're ever interested in doing this, 
You can go and um, uh, find a program uh, and try this for yourself. Uh, let me, here's a couple of the ones I did. I did a barn and this is actually uh, six images I put together. I, Cause I don't, I don't have a really wide angle lens to do this. And I was wanting to get all the details in also too, when you overlap, you won't, you need to make sure when you're doing this type of work that your images do overlap. It is important. Um, so it, there's a smooth, there's a seamless stitching that goes on. And here's my last image of a cotton field, which uh, I also, other than sunflowers and uh, wildflowers, I love photographing cotton fields. And I, there's a cotton field that's over here by my house that uh, is starting to is starting to get to the point where uh, it's full. It's almost fully bloomed. I'm not quite sure uh, uh, the exact terminology of it, but it's I, it's been fun to watch it from the planting. I've been photographing it from the planting to the bloom, the flowers, and now they're they're getting all the the white puppy cotton. So. That is what I have for today. Um, I'll send it back to you, Cindy. Well, this is um, this is amazing. Uh, let's see. Let's unshare. Okay. <laughs> Where are you? There you are. Yeah, hit the hit your unshare button, and we will. Oh, stop share. Stop share. Got it. There you go. There you go. Um, this has been such amazing information. Um, I, I know that I'm an amateur photographer and I absolutely love nature. And I have just a little digital camera and I'm so envious of you with um, your camera because I have landscape and close up. And that's yeah. it. Back row, yes. <laughs> So, you know, I, I, you know, you, you are inspiring um, and, and you encourage that, you know, if you can, you can get out there and do your angles, your lighting, um, you know, whatever you can control on your camera. Um, it's just been really interesting to see how you, you've uh, approached nature. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have to respect it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. isn't nature a wonderful subject? For photography. It is. Mm -hmm. it is, it is. And you, you have to respect it and you have to, um, uh, it is absolutely beautiful. And one thing I've always found interesting and, and I, I didn't point out, but, you know, we talk about, we are surrounded by colors, either natural colors, manufactured colors. One thing that I've always found interesting, and I, I point out from time to time when I remember it with my students, just this just popped into my head. But if you look at a flower field, if you look at nature and you look at all the flowers and all the colors, nothing, nothing clashes. It all works harmoniously together. Something to think about. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I'm still trying to master red flowers. Yeah, <laughs> I that's... can never photograph a red flower. I actually went out to, okay, so in Georgetown, I'm in Round Rock in Georgetown. They have the Red Poppy Festival every year. And if you go over to Georgetown, I mean, you will find um, the red poppies growing. They bloom. And I came across some, and they didn't have the Poppy Festival this year. Um, but, you know, the poppies still bloomed. And I, I will draw, I drove, I go, I want to photograph these red poppies. So I drove around Georgetown. And you find them literally, um, the ones I photographed um, were um, coming up through cracks in the sidewalk. And, and I got some really interesting images of them. Um, but uh, that is the red color can, can be difficult to capture. Well, do we have any questions, Lee? Um, no questions, but we did have comments that they really enjoyed it. They thought the pictures were cool and all the little tricks you shared with them. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate this. This is kind of new for all three of us. And I'd like to, to thank um, Cynthia and Lee for their help. And we were just kind of putting, trying to put this together the best that we could through uh, 
not perhaps the best of circumstances, but I think we did it. I think I it was really, it was really fun. I had fun doing it. I was nervous too. I always get nervous doing these things. I just, you know. Well, you did, you did great. And um, yes. CTC is very, very, very lucky to have such a gifted photographer that um, teaches oh, okay. classes. So guys, you can learn all kinds of things. Take uh, some of uh, Professor Andrada's uh, photography classes. I'm still trying to convince her to do them after work hours so that I can get into one of her classes. <laughs> maybe, maybe, but photo one and photo two, I teach those classes on campus. So um, that's all I have today. All right. Well, thank you so much for visiting with us. And um, guess what? Next week we're starting our Hispanic Heritage events. So make sure that you tune in. We've got cooking. We've got LULAC, two LULAC councils that are going to be talking. We have Little Joe and La Familia, um, which is amazing. And um, we also have an all Spanish event, uh, Poetry Slam. So a lot going on. And um, we're just thrilled that you guys tune in to the uh, virtual library events. Um, thank you again. Professor Thank you for Andrade. having me. Yeah, and um, we will see you guys on campus. You guys have an awesome weekend, yep. and uh, we will be seeing you bright and early at noon on Monday. So okay. um, Thank you. we'll see y'all later. And Professor Andrade, Andrade, don't leave us yet. So okay. bye, guys. You take us out, Miss Lee.